So, um, I don't know. First, before we start, I, I just want to do a round table, whatever you have in mind or whatever the subject is, uh, the hot topic for you to these days is. I don't want, I don't know if you want to share something. So I let you start, Andrea, as you, it's your first time. <laughs> So let me find the unmute button. Um, <laughs> perfect. No, so, um, well, I still have, uh, I, I didn't prepare on the data slides. Uh, so I heard it, uh, the role of design in society. So currently, I would say um, on this topic, my current focus is uh, designing sessions, workshops, meetings. That's what I do. Uh, professionally as a facilitator. And so I would say maybe currently my, my, my focus is on, on that kind of design uh, for society and uh, trying to um, orchestrate and engineer collaboration uh, in order to allow people to move forward uh, better and faster and those kind of things. And maybe also more, um, yeah, but, but you know, would want to participate in at a more level uh, level. So um, yeah, that's a little bit my point of view, maybe as entry point to this uh, this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Don't know who wants to go next. I can nominate Mark. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I I guess I could start. I could kick off the data thing. Okay. A little. Um, the reason it came into my mind was because I was, well, one book I read a while ago, and one that I was just kind of reading at the time, and the one from a while ago was called "Weapons of Math Destruction" by Kathy O'Neill, and the one that I'm currently reading um, is called "Living in Data" by Jared Thorpe, mm -hmm. and. The reason it kind of came up to my mind was this notion that that with data-driven design as part of what it is that we do, we tend to rely on design on data for decision making. Both of those um, both of those pieces of work point to this idea that there is bias in the data. And there's also ethical concerns around the actual measurement. So there's more, there's more that kind of happens prior to us getting the data than sometimes we are aware of. So political choices and what's recorded and how it's recorded. Um, and so I think it makes a, it makes for a complex relationship between designers and data. And if the overall idea of the, of these these talks, these conversations is around becoming a better designer, then I think becoming a better designer entails understanding data better. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the idea. Um, and not just, not just understanding data in terms of making sense of the data that we get, but understanding the, the roots that underlie the collection of that data, who is being uh, whose data is being collected? Are they aware that the data is being collected? Um, you know, is there anything in that that um, makes us question the data so that we're not using biased data to come up with solutions that are not, you know, helpful or worse, detrimental to a given population? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's really funny because uh, since last time I actually forgot what was the word Mark said and I had like this ongoing chain of what was the D word? <laughs> I just remembered how, you know, I was like, I was one of the options. My name was on the list too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting topic to see that you know we, we have this digital transformation and whenever we're talking about this digitization we're talking about becoming data driven finding that there is 
some, let's say, at the, the top of the pyramid, there is wisdom that relies on data. And mm-hmm. now it's it's almost like we are viewing this data as a, maybe as a piece of raw information or something that is just, I don't know, it's, it's almost like a, a basic, it's the atom of knowledge, if we, we, we could put it like that. And I'm just, I think what I'm curious to know more about is how do you actually quantify it in a way without the AI, without using technology? How do we as humans interact with data other than, you know, in a passive way where it's just being collected from us and used in ways? But how do we actually learn from data and create our own models and structures? Is this you know, strictly tied into the practices designers have, or do we find it in other areas where it's, and there's a need for conceptual modeling or anything like that? That's, that's actually a a really good question. I I would make uh, um, probably a difference between two types to broadly type of uh, broadly defined type of data is one which is explicit, the data that we want to collect for any reason. That sounds like data that we can actually use for something, and data that is that that are implicit, like the one we use to have our intuition and come to conclusion, not in a formal way. Right, and so I think the two are really important in in terms of being aware of what type of data we are using in our daily lives. And as as designers, we use a mix of the two. Right, we we have like our intuition about something because of, because of past experience, uh, because of what we are seeing right now in a given situation, and the one that is uh, explicit that we want to collect to be able to refine our point of view on something and actually make hopefully better decisions about what we want to do next. <clears throat> so I would do would do this kind of difference. I think it's useful. Um, and yeah, being aware that some data are not really, are not really explicitly, you know, accessible in a way, some kind of hidden data somewhere. (laughs) Yeah. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I also think there's another distinction, um, which is qualitative and quantitative uh, data, uh, yeah. which I think is an interesting distinction to to keep in mind. And uh, I, I think this also, um, I, regarding what um, Diana was talking about, I, I think this is also important because I, 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 there's a definition I quite like or what is the difference fundamentally between or one of the differences or, uh, or we could even say affordances <laughs> which uh, qualitative data or quantitative data has that qualitative data doesn't have and quantitative data is uh, transferable and qualitative data is not that transferable. I think that's also an interesting mm. idea. Anyway, let's just. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also the way that we, the way that we process those different kinds of information are are different, right? That that there seems to be a kind of um, a more explicit sense of interpretation with qualitative data than there is with quantitative data 
and yet there is a whole lot of interpretation, even with quantitative data, that sometimes goes unmentioned, right? There's that famous saying that says that if you interrogate the data, it will confess. <laughs> Meaning that if you look at a data set long enough, you can, you can basically twist it to say whatever you want to support your point of view, right? Um, so I think that there's a, there's the biases that go into the actual collection of the data. So what do we collect? Who do we collect it from? When do we collect it? Um, and then there's the, the biases of interpreting that data. I think that lay into it. Yeah. Into it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's important to, I think what is, what is, uh, there's uh, some kind of myth around data that somehow it is possible to make it unbiased, either as a way of collecting it or as a way of, uh, um, you know, um, making sense of it. And I, I think it's a myth because uh, even if we create the best algorithm possible to treat data, uh, as it is an algorithm, it is designed by someone who has bias or a group of people who has bias. And even, even if we use all the methods possible to mitigate those biases, it's likely, uh, it's likely that it will remain some, somewhere in the, in the way it is done, uh, some bias and we might not notice it. So I think it's a safer position to assume that everything is biased from the start go and look for what kind of bias that we want to have in our processes. Like when we, when we gather qualitative data, we know that we are looking for the stories. We know that we are looking for something that is, as Jonathan said, transposable and uh, that we can reuse and make sense of it in different contexts. So we might want to go in that direction, purposefully having a bias for stories and for what people say. And, and when we go for quantitative, we know that we want to look at specific numbers. And so we, we know it's biased, but it's, uh, you know, intentional. And, and therefore it, it serves its, its purpose, you know? And I think it's this where it's not, it's not seen as a problem and, and more like a tool for, for whatever end we, we, we have in mind. I don't know, it's like, it's kind of a ethics for <laughs> using data. <laughs> It's like right now our discussion, right, is a uh, is a form of uh, data gathering in a sense. It's biased because of its uh, format, but it's on it's on purpose, right? We we want it this way, um, and it's imperfect. We anyone looking at the board right now without the process of collecting the data, without participating in the process of collecting the data, would take out a different story from whatever we discussed today, right? Wouldn't you say that the fact that we are giving each other processed thoughts that this is no longer data? I mean, we're, it's not that we bring in biases, but I'm actually kind of constructing my thoughts and my worldviews and I'm putting them forward. It's not just a mere collection of observations, but they're really infused with, with the interpretation. I think everyone does that, at least in this uh, setting. And maybe, you know, it kind of ties back into this, let's say, intentional data. We're kind of, you're giving it a purpose from the start. You're not just collecting the whole world in <laughs> one go. You're trying to be selective because, you know, it has to be purposeful. Otherwise, it's, yeah, it makes no sense for humans to have data. Yes. Again, it's who who handles the data what what do we do with it it is more valuable than the data itself and just like as mark was saying you you're kind of 
contaminating it with your interpretation. The data will tell any story you want it to tell because, yeah, that's how we observe things. I'm thinking about mathematics and someone told me there was a this physics professor and he was like, careful not to get lost in mathematics. He was showing me all these patterns that you could come up with and, you know, try and visualize these formulas. And I was like, look how amazing it is. The numerolo numerology is so amazing, but it's so deceitful because you can see how data turns into these amazing patterns that seem to make sense. When in fact, it's just, you know, some sort of mere mathematical aesthetics, but it's not as profound as we would like it to be. And I think we mm -hmm. sometimes do that to data. Yeah. It sounds like if you want to become a better designer on that specific topic, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like we should be careful or mindful about everything we do from the beginning. But it don't, I don't, I don't see. I don't see this kind of carefulness in practice. No, I think that's, I think that's part of it. And that's, I kind of just put this idea that if you consider the notion of using data, mm -hmm. like using data to make decisions, um, it becomes a kind of a fuel for decision making. Right. And it's the same kind of garbage in garbage out problem that you have, right. That if, if it really is the fuel that runs the engine of what it is that you're doing, then if it's, if it's no good, then the output can't be any good. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this, and I don't think there's a lot of questioning. I mean, and this happens in very naive ways and then it happens in kind of deeper ethical ways. There are a lot of clients who look at an analytics dashboard that we have not a lot, but, but it happens consistently enough that will react to the first layer of information that they see and make a panic decision based on that information without looking more deeply at the way that, you know, sets of analytics work together to create a broader picture that the, at, that at first glance, it doesn't give you. Everything. And so that's problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Where people will be overreacting to one vector of something without knowing the context, without understanding you know what the actual inputs mean and making bad decisions so that's the that's the the kind of naive top level version of it the the deeper level is that you work with a data set that is inherently biased that has some kind of reinforcing property in it for example like people from a certain area are charged more for insurance because there are more incidents in that area. So fewer people in that area get insurance. Therefore, mm -hmm. there are fewer insured there. You know what I mean? So something kind of cycles out of control there based on, based on the way that data is collected. Yes. Right? And so that I think is a deeper, as I think there's two ways that there's that not understanding data is problematic. Well, I mean, there's multiple ways, but those are two ways right now. That, <laughs> That I'm kind of thinking of. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't know of any design program that 
whether long or short, that spends any time really looking at data as sub as a subject matter, right? It mm -hmm. has, for for something for a a field, a profession that uses terms like data driven design, the ability to actually understand data doesn't seem to be a core principle of the education of that profession. I think. Now, or if it's the case, we are looking at very specific kind of data, right? Right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I agree. I agree, but at the same time, it sounds to be not in the defined in the design field itself, but outside of it, there are professions of people designing, you know, either the processes through which we gather data, or at least as a, like say, as a company, or the processes through which the data goes into being processed into decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I think that's uh, uh, data scientists or those kind of people, for me, are uh, the one, I mean, you, actually using the, the tools to, to design the medium of gathering data, processing data, making decisions out of it. I don't know. That's, to me, they are the designers of those kind of things, right? Yeah, and I think it's worth understanding that there's an entire set of skills and an entire profession that actually does that before designers claim to be really working with data. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what usually I, I do think it, it, it's oh, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. You know, sorry, I, I do think it's important again to distinguish the qualitative and quantitative uh, cases because um, qualitative is idios idiosyncratic, meaning it's biased at the root. You, you know that it's biased, and and that's actually part of why it's uh, it's interesting because it's contextual, it's um, uh, it's specific, um, and it's less transferable. Uh, quantitative data is is more general; it makes more sweeping generalizations and it is it, this, and, and you can really introduce you, the, 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 the trap with quantitative data is that it seems non-biased, but as you said, you can, you can make it tell the stories you want it to tell. Whereas qualitative data just tells the stories that it tells. And I think it's much more difficult to actually bias qualitative data. But it's extremely specific, so it's very hard to generalize and make generalizations with, with qualitative data. You can do it, of course, to some extent, but, um, you know, someone talking about his situation in, in some place might be totally different to someone else's situation in another place. Whereas all these, all these, all these specificities are basically erased from, um, from quantitative data. And the other thing is quantitative data erases the causal relationships between between things because you reconstruct the the causal processes in your model when you analyze the data whereas someone telling a story naturally embeds uh, a, a kind of causal thinking and causal pathway in the way he tells the story it might be true or not true it might be just the way his model of the world and what he how he sees or he or she sees how things happened and and um, what he or she was thinking about. Uh, quantitative data, it's the researcher uh, who is going to uh, impute on the data his own uh, model of how the world works. And he might, he might actually um, take care of the bias and take it into account, or he might not know about it and not take it into account. Uh, and I think that's more the, the worry for me is, is that the quantitative data it, it seems neutral, but actually uh, is, is, is not. Yes. I mean, just one of the things that, that the inference that 
um, quantitative data can be kind of like specific, you know, or that qualitative data can be universal. Like in that translation, I think is one of the issues that happens, right? Where somebody takes in, takes into a, or goes in and does a study that is qualitative, that is very small and very specific to a moment and then draws universal conclusions out of it. Yeah, well, it, it happens a lot in, in design yeah. processes. I agree. Yeah. But I think it, I think it's interesting if you if you accept that quantitative uh, qualitative data is inherently biased, but is so like explicitly biased that it's it's okay. Then it, it helps you understand that that specific moment that you're extracting that data, right? Understanding yeah. that, that context. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a story that <laughs> I I experienced. Uh, some times ago in a, in a company that does uh, training uh, training solutions for for the masses uh, and the CEO comes and during a during a meeting and start to explain that we have to make the trading platform accessible on Tesla's uh, screens uh, because his friends um, they try it and it doesn't work on their Teslas. <laughs> and it was the priority <laughs> for him. <laughs> and you notice the you notice the kind of bias in this story, right? That the friends of the CEO are likely not to be the mass <laughs> of the users of these platforms that are supposed to be for everyone, right? Like at, at the time in Switzerland, there were like, I don't know, 100 Tesla owners, something like that. <laughs> so it was like a really narrow and really specific uh, that data set. <laughs> and he drew conclusion out of it. Uh, and it was kind of emotional about it because it was about his friends and, you know, it's something you can relate to because he himself had a Tesla and never tried before and he realized it, did, it didn't work. So, you know, maybe we have to make um, this kind of, I don't know, I think there's something that we have to add there is uh, the um, um, emotional um, um, aspects of data that make us less likely to be or more likely to be blind about some of the biases we 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 were talking about um but yeah i totally agree with what mark and jonathan said here <laughs> I, just, I just noticed that somebody said or somebody put it on the board i don't know who does his personal data more of an nft than a transferable yes. asset was that you no no, I don't know, but uh, oh, you're guilty. <laughs> yes, well, you're guilty of using <laughs> NFT and the. Uh... Yeah, but I was thinking about it. Like you know, you you get this piece of data that is NFT and it's non fungible, and people make such a fuss about it, and it's got this. Yeah, but like I'm thinking about you know what is a true NFT, a truly valuable NFT, and this could be a piece of really important data that you own as a person you know and i think that one is much more important and much more valuable than uh let's say a bunch of pixels that you share as art as an nft so i was just trying to like find ways to justify the existence of nft and the further development because i think you know as a prototype they're fine as they are but i would like them to develop into something that's truly meaningful and that was my thought behind it how much do we actually uh share our data you know how, how willing how far are we willing to go with our data you know if we are to like sell your data for money and because like now we're just like giving it away for free just to subscribe and get here and this and that but actually if someone were to just track your existence like oculus might want with <laughs> facebook so you know 
you just have this choice of selling your data away and kind of yeah feeling so ex being so exposed wasn't that what gdpr was meant to 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 do that you own your data and you can transfer it and erase it here and create it here and move it around um i guess to a certain extent but i was thinking even more like thinking more about the qualitative data of you you know something that it's maybe like a very personal story let's say like your therapy logs things like this you know not just medical records or demographics or things like that yeah and what people what people will how people will interpret that as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can distort your the representation of yourself. I think that's one of the last things you should be worried about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. So actually on this subject, so um, I was reading some stuff by um, Indy Young and she had this, uh, this comment, which was, uh, that a building for the average is actually harmful to to people and because the, the or 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 building products services or or anything really if you if you're considering average people average uh humans average customers average users whatever you want to call them uh, the, the, uh, the, the, actually, if you're aiming for the average, it's, it's, it's harmful. But then I had my question. I wondered what you guys thought is, okay, how do you avoid building for the average and at the same time still have a viable product business, whatever. I mean, it's a really interesting idea. The, the question is the subset of the population for which you were building i think in some sense right like like average of the global population average of your stated market right like like what is the average of what first of all i mean the the idea of average is problematic right we're not beings that exist on one vector so trying to figure out average is <laughs> it's difficult um but yeah like the i think the bounds that you put around the group of people that you're building for is the first question there right like is it are you building an app for the average early adopter right or are you building an app for the average human whatever that means. And I mean, again, average is problematic, but do, I, I didn't read the article, Jonathan. Is there, is there some mention of that, of the scale of the market or population? Well, I, I mean, th that was exactly kind of my, re my reaction. Um, unfortunately, the, I, I don't remember exactly what it, I don't remember if it was a tweet or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember where I heard it, but the, so I can't point you to anything, but the, that was the general gist of it is that um, building for average means that you're harming people. And, um, and I, that was, I mean, what you're talking about is exactly what, what my reaction was. Well, well, then, I mean, at some point, it, isn't it a matter of the size of the group you're considering and uh, how, how similar these, the, the people in this group are or, or not? So yeah. well, I, I guess I guess one of the point yeah. is because I I also heard this uh, di not this phrase in exactly this way but something like that, and I think one of the one of the idea attached to that is is like um, you say you have a product and you uh, you you are trying to target what the most people want, and you wait until you have exactly that like uh what most people say they want for instance and that you 
build a feature in your product based on what most people said um, that you 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 harm your potentially you create something that's uh, that is not so really wanted or you just wait too long until you you did something or something like that so I mean it's not I, I don't think it's it's as simple as as uh, as this uh, seems to be um, but um, I think this this is related to that idea of you know wait, waiting for or uh, trying to answer uh, to answer like um, what most people uh, needs or what most people um, issues are I don't know something like that <clears throat> it's also a question of is it harmful to those people who are on the margins that don't even fit within like a couple of standard deviations of average. So is it yeah. about accessibility or is it a question of it being a poor, you know, business decision to not have a small enough, narrow enough market, right? There are two, I think they're from what, you know, what perspective it was written yeah. from? Um, no, I really don't have any context. Sorry, it was really just that oh, kind yeah. of soundbite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it sounds good on paper, right? You, you like it's it, it sounds like a convincing tagline for for Twitter, right? <laughs> That's what it is. It's like a, a highly reduced uh, type of idea in two lines. <laughs> Yeah. And he talked about the map and Tesla owners, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But, well, I, I, what I heard, when I heard the, those kind of um, idea of uh, designing for the average is helpful, is uh, in the sense that first you you don't try to kind of um, really innovate with your product or you don't really try to to look for something a characteristic of of one type of problem that you could solve in a specific way uh, you try to be like something a bit general generalist in, a, in your approach and and yeah I think it's mixed with uh, this idea of uh, designing for 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 a group of people that is not really rep representative your of your like extremes, as you mentioned, people with disabilities, for instance. Or if you if you imagine an application where, um, like like Google uh, Sheets, for instance, uh, you could say it it answers well most people problems with this kind of tool, but it's not a tool for professionals, for instance. And so you, you have like this, uh, this extreme type of users that use Excel, for instance, in a really specific way that Google Sheet does, cannot do, right? So uh, I would say it's, it's one of you. Oh. What happened? <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> you ever just get picked up? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was we weird. We weren't, we weren't drinking enough from the. Uh, <laughs> well. I thought the bouncers came in and just took us out, That's like right, rude yeah. customers. Yeah. Maybe maybe they thought the conversation was too average. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> I mean, there's another, there's that book, oh man, um, written by an economist, Tyler, maybe Tyler Cowan, called Average is Over. Um, and so that, it was actually, I mean, I don't, I skimmed it. 
there's a there's this notion too that in a world and it's it's very u.s centered in that particular book but in a world where there's a a, a widening gap between those who are willing to understand technology and kind of educate themselves to technology and those who don't right with this kind of widening gap of that kind of accessibility that there's a hole in the middle and he wrote this book called average is over and it was really about that fact that 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 demographic doesn't exist anymore or is or exists less and less um mm -hmm. I mean, it does correlate to the middle class, kind of, but I think it was more in a kind of in a technolo technological sense, like access to technology. And so there is also societally a kind of a, a gap at average. And that, I think, if I extrapolate from that, also makes it that statistically there is an average, but that in fact there might not be any there there, right? Mm -hmm. Because to to average out between two poles of something doesn't necessarily mean that there's a regular distribution at the middle of that, that that average actually exists. I don't know if that made any sense. It made sense in my head, but. Yes. Yeah. What about the, the other side? Okay, so if it's not average, it's highly specific or let's say, I don't know, unique. So I don't want to call myself average. So I want a certain service that will fit me but if we get this kind of thing it's usually tied into a, you have to belong to a certain group whether i think you're right the average doesn't really make sense anymore but you want to create some sort of category you want to give to uniformize a certain group to, to a certain extent to be able to give a set of features that they can tune in. And I think this ties down to behavior, to how we, again, interact with data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I, I keep on thinking about TikTok because my, my father for his whole life has criticized me for spending time, you know, on the internet. And then TikTok <laughs> happened and he is so addicted to it. He, he just doesn't have conversations with us anymore because he just <laughs> Now he has two phones because when the other kind of needs charging, he takes the other to like keep on scrolling. Wow. That's how bad it is when he's not working, he's on TikTok. So, you know, it got me thinking like he's a very unique person, you know, and he was very resistant to technology. So you couldn't call him an average user, but he became the most average person to use TikTok. You know, it, it just conditioned him to belong to a certain category, which wasn't necessarily the averageness of things. Mm -hmm. but it made him belong to a certain group of users. Does, yes. Does he, have, does he have any awareness of the, the fact that he's being algorithmed? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to put it. He's, he's not very wise when it comes to technology. I'm telling him that he's being conditioned, but he's like, he doesn't really care. He's prone to addictive behavior anyway. So maybe that's kind of his group. He likes to smoke and drink and he has a very weak will to, to fight against these. So this is just another addiction to him. Yeah, but yeah you're right. He is definitely being conditioned to that algorithm that knows him so well and he just can't fight it yeah the danger of data in the hands of an algorithm worse than in the the eyes of an interpreter yeah uh, yeah about that i i love to to play like a game with uh youtube's algorithm like i i you know i dismiss some of the proposal you know on purpose and at the end at some point it seems to be not not knowing what i want you know it's like proposing me a bit of that a bit of that like you know, like someone who just don't know you, like exactly the opposite of what it should be, right? And and that's really funny because once you start to look at a specific type of video, it start proposing only that everywhere, yeah. you know? And so you you say, I don't want this, I don't want this. And at the end, it's just, just lust. <laughs> it just don't, doesn't know how to, you know, treat you because uh, it's, it's, you know, not designed for this kind of behavior, actually. Uh, it is kind of a it is kind of a blunt object the 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 uh, YouTube algorithm I find you know 
Yeah, well, it's it's good at detecting um, some patterns, but when you go outside of those patterns, it's totally lost and useless. It's actually worse to use YouTube with it than if I just could uh, decide exactly what I want. You know, like, yeah, I, I have like, I don't know, 20 channels that I like to, to, to watch, but I also want to see anything else outside of those. So... <laughs> Like not specifically on one topic. Like last time, I I just watched uh, like six videos about uh, learning to play guitar, and after that, my my whole feed is just that music videos. It's like who who is dumb as this, you know, as thinking that because I watch six videos about guitar and and music that I just want to 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 watch music stuff. It's like it's really stupid, right? It's just so dumb. And that you that you no longer care about the last year and a half of other stuff that you were watching. Yes, it's like because it's all like disappeared. In your I, I'm this. Feed, I'm right? this. Um, moving. You know. Yeah. Changing my mind every day. <laughs> you know? That's right. It, it clearly it clearly doesn't um, adapt to our uh, attention deficit disorder and inability. <laughs> It needs to it needs to throw in something there and yeah. mix it up a little bit. Yeah, it, it's, you know what I noticed with it? It's actually you need to feed them more data points. So the more channels you're subscribed to, the more chances you might have to get yeah. some things. But you, you have to be very careful to what you're subscribing and always kind of correcting it. It has li its limits though. Because I, I have like so many channels at some point it, it you know it uh unsubscribe me from like old ones because it decides at some point yeah you know it's like you have already 100 why would you like to have 101 who knows <laughs> uh something like that and 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 i realized that some you know i have like randomly some uh point of interest about one specific topics but it moves on like i, I change at some time at some point i just don't want to just watch this so I watch something else and it keeps proposing me this thing. Whereas I just, just want to have like different things to follow, you know? And it's right now my YouTube uh, feed is just crap, just crap. So I have to actually input things in the search, you know, to find <laughs> what I would like to see <laughs> instead of relying on, on the algorithm. And sometimes, you know, it has one good proposal and I, and it seems like I'm feeding the, the the algorithm with, hey, I propose you something that you want to see. Yes, I'm working well. No, you don't. <laughs> it's just shit anyway. <laughs> it's just one in a thousand. <laughs> I feel like yeah. it used to be better, but you see with the saturation of all this content on YouTube, it just got yes. worse. Like maybe two or three years ago, I used to get some of the best recommendations. But now I am begging the algorithm to give me something of value and I don't get it. Yes. Yeah. I get less music, for instance. I just, I can't seek things that I would like, but I don't know even how to word them. So I think that's the problem with data. You know, you need to mm. somehow come with a framework so it understands you, you know, so you're able to filter it in, you know, like let data in. <laughs> but yeah. Or sometimes you just, you just heard a new term that really well define a set of ideas you had and you wanted to look for. And, you know, and magically it proposes you, you find stuff that, that you care with this term better than with all the terms you tried before. And yeah, and sometimes it's just random, like you heard it in a conversation or you watch a video, you, you watch a, a clip, I don't know, and you, you heard this term, you know, and you use it and you realize that, oh, a door just opened <laughs> to a new, a new world of things <laughs> that you never expected, you know, something like that. I really find it interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I think TikTok is, is no, no different. I, I think TikTok is worse than, than YouTube for that because, you know, it, it's for, it, it looks for, um, like, the short term type of um, um, attention span and 
And so the patterns are a bit different from YouTube. So YouTube recently tried to push a, a lot for shorts, what they call shorts, to go in the same direction. But I think you lose the interest, the, the interesting part of what is YouTube videos, you know. And this is exactly what I dislike about TikTok and those kind of stuff. That, you know, it's, just, it's short term and there's no... Like, I, I don't mind watching one hour videos on YouTube. No, I don't mind. I can, I can like, listen to it while doing something else. Like, that, that I don't really mind about 30 minutes, one hour videos. <clears throat> but, uh, like, yeah, when I publish something on YouTube, uh, it says, yeah, I'll try the short format, like, one, one, two minutes. Like, I, I don't do this kind of shit. <laughs> I don't want to. It's, like, not my, not my deal, you know? And, yeah, it's kind of... Kind of weird. Um, and on about the discussion before that about averages, I think there's something about um, on uh, Clayton Christensen uh, books about disruptive innovation. That's, that uh, is interesting about that because it explains that when you create um, some kind of average in your markets, you create also the space for newcomers to enter your markets. So because you, you set the, some rules about how things are in your markets, when you become like big enough, so you are, you know, you don't really compete for in your market or you compete with just a few other actors, that means there's like some kind of um, average that is, that is created in your market. So I don't know if it's frame it, if it's framed exactly like that. But it's the idea of you created some kind of um, standard for your market. And with it, you created also a space for newcomers that does things differently to come in and disrupt, disrupt the, the market. And, um, and I, I, in the, uh, in, you know, at some point, they will become the new average and some newcomers will be able to enter. And so that's the idea of disruptive innovation is exactly that idea of uh, challenging the, the standards of, of the average of a market. So what, what I find uh, very interesting also, this reminds me of another kind of book. Um, it's the Zero to One from Peter Thiel. And, and I find that's, it's a very interesting idea because so the core idea of this book is that Basically, to have a successful business, you need to become a, a monopoly. And I always, this kind of changed, made me look at things a bit differently. And I, I kind of wonder actually what, uh, how we can define this. For instance, if you're uh, the only pizzeria in a neighborhood and basically you know, it's hard to reach that neighborhood or let's say the only pizzeria in a village, then uh, you have to have a monopoly. Can you say one has a monopoly? I mean, is there a real distinction between, I mean, I know there's a, there's a obviously a kind of uh, more distinction on the impact. So a monopoly can, uh, you know, have uh, set the prices, etc. But if we put that to a side, and we, you know, is, is this idea of a monopoly, like a pizzeria being the only pizzeria in a village, hmm. is this something that makes sense? I think it's kind of related a bit to this idea of, of average, uh, average users. What do you guys think of this idea of monopoly? I don't know if you've read this book or not. I think that's interesting, but would you call you know, just being the sole uh, organization, you know, in one space, a monopolizer. I think there, it's got something to do with control and dominance, being able to overpower mm -hmm. other organizations that make you a uh, monopolizing force. But I'm thinking about data and context. If someone happens to monopolize all the data in the world, it, he, that organization, I guess, you know, probably owns the world. It can own mm. governments and all these things. So I guess that's yeah. the danger of monopolizing. Well, we're not that far from it. 
Yeah. Actually, actually, this is one of the issue with today already with uh, NFTs and Web3 stuff and exact, you know, it's like you have the, you know, the whole claim of Web3 is like you, you remove the middleman by, by being actually the one out that owns data and that decides what to do with data, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And th this is a myth because to be able to um, channel the data somewhere to do something with it, you need a, you need an, you need, you need an intermediary. And, and so with the rise of NFTs, and um, uh, crypto, crypto stuff. You you saw you see also the rise of platforms that are services that uh, exactly do that. That uh, is a, a channel for data. So you have to go through one of these. They are like brokers in the in the finance world, and they and they have they have to exist in order to um, you know to put together all the data that you need to use to do whatever you want to do with the data. And so by, by doing that, you create, um, you potentially create um, situations because there's no regulation that prevents it, uh, where one actor overcome the market and become a monopoly because, because two things, first, they, they are the only one be able to process all the data because they own the, the channels to, to for, for that, and they created the uh, circumstances for others to not compete with them, and so this is where I think it's an uh, interesting way to frame monopoly is where you created a, a, um, a situation where it's not or it's really not likely that someone will compete with you anyway because you created you know many blockers and uh, either by law or by um, a set of uh, policies you put in place, you prevent the existence of others <clears throat> in your space. And so this is where you become a monopoly. And it's exactly what you can see right now with the rise of uh, cryptocurrencies and web free stuff is exactly that. But actually, I mean, this, I mean, this whole question of what is a monopoly or not is, is actually quite difficult to answer because, um, and, and this is actually very uh, uh, contem uh, contemporary as a question because people have been obviously thinking about Google and Facebook and all this as monopolies. I think even going back to this zero to one and Peter Thiel, he actually gives the example of Google as being a monopoly of search and one of the reasons they created alphabet was because they could say well actually we're not a monopoly because look we're in technology and therefore search is they, they've recategorized themselves as a technology company where obviously they're not a monopoly in that but if you just look at search they're a monopoly basically in this in search and uh what i find interesting is for the 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 prosecutors or the, 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 from the legal standpoint, it's people want to redefine the idea of monopoly because here that actually Google, Facebook, all this, they've reduced prices for consumers in a lot of, uh, in a lot of respects. So we all understand that there's something nefarious about having Googles and Facebooks that basically we all kind of intuitively believe they're monopolies, but uh, contrary to, you know, the, the Rob, uh, Robert Barons and uh, like the old school monopolies where basically people cornered a whole market and then started increasing prices and this was very nefarious for consumers. The Google and Facebook actually have made, provided a lot of stuff for free. So free services, well, free, obviously we understand that we're giving our data in exchange, but it, it, it's, it, it makes it very difficult to define actually what in what respect they're acting as a monopoly, these organizations. Yeah, I will mitigate the claim on free because actually it's a marketing model where well, the, the mere fact that you exist on Facebook is, is, a, 
you you are valued something because you're potentially reachable through you know uh, their their marketing platform, but they, others can target you with ads. <clears throat> so you are uh, you are worth something, even if you are not using it every day. So you are you you are you have a value for Facebook anyway. So your yeah. being existence on the platform is, you know, <laughs> you mean you, 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 yeah, you are worth money in some, in some sense, you know, but yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's hard to define. Hey, um, Andrea, you wanted to say something? Oh, you have to log off. Okay. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Good to see you. I also have to um, we, make my we, way as well. We don't hear you, Andrea. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Andrea. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all the great discussions, and it was really a pleasure to attend. And I wish you all a very nice uh, continuation of the day or the evening, depending on when you are. <laughs> Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Join us next time. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I will. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. I'm gonna, uh, I'll sign off as well. Back to the day. Okay. I'm going to. So, are we happy with the data or worried that we're going to live in this crazy world? Just so. <laughs> we're doing it to ourselves. I know. I know. We already we already live in it. Yeah. Yes. Living in data. Yes. Uh, yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a really interesting um, keyword, uh, might say. Do we know what's going to be next time? The E word? E. An what's the E word? Ecstasy so. or what's that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I we'll have something like... out. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, don't hesitate to, to share it in the, um, in the Slack. Slack. Yeah. Yes. Would be, we'll okay. be great. Yeah. Well, right. Thank you, guys. Nice to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.